good afternoon everyone uh, thanks for joining today uh, for the second uh, chapter uh, the session on second chapter of the nabh nt travel uh, guidelines this is part of the nabh education webinar series that we uh, at uh, kaho tamil nadu has been organizing so i <clears throat> am privileged to introduce dr parivalavan rajavelu uh, he is an extraordinary uh, gentleman for, firstly he is a laparoscopy surgeon uh, at the sundara medical foundation he has done his uh, mbbs ms and the frcs at uh, the royal college of surgeons in uh, edinburgh he is also the founder of the skills for med which is into training and uh, skills training for the hospital employees and he has uh, been behind uh, designing a lot of training programs for kaho and even without kaho beyond kaho he has been uh, part of a lot of uh, has designed a lot of uh, training programs for the uh, healthcare uh, staff so thank you very much uh, dr pari for joining us today uh, we are all looking forward to hear from you uh, we know very well how uh, eloquent a speaker you are so i now pass on uh, pass it on to you please proceed back yeah thank you yeah, so please. much for the introduction yeah. i know it's really a pleasure to be with you and also with uh, sister rama rajshekhan who's a close friend of ours um so without you know wasting much time let us start the presentation um because it's a, it's one of the biggest chapters um in the nabh manual uh, so let me see are you able to see my uh, presentation yeah you uh, good afternoon everyone now i'm really happy to take this second edition of the uh, tamil nadu a chapter of uh, the nabh education series which is the entry level and i am going to talk about the second chapter the care of patients uh, which is also known as the cop now the cop is um, uh, is probably the most important chapter for the clinicians now uh, and i being a clinician uh, this is the chapter i refer to every now and again and uh, also many of you i don't know how many of you are doctors but many of the quality personnel uh, the main problem uh, seems to be that you know the doctors are not cooperating we don't know uh, how to go about this so having a doctor talk about this is what uh, kaho planned to put a googly into this so that you know it is no longer true that doctors are not interested the awareness of uh, nabh is quite high and it just needs a little bit of nudge to get the doctors to look into the uh, part of the cop which they are supposed to be um, implementing so the cop as you can see has got eight uh, standards so standard 1 talks about norms and practices two start talks about emergency service three transfusion uh, blood transfusion four is about icu and hdo care five is obstetrics care six is pediatrics seven is anesthesia and finally eight is surgery so these are the things as you can see the whole gamut of clinical services has been compressed into this chapter and so once you get a understanding of this chapter whatever you need to implement on the clinical side will be clear to you so the every um, chapter of nabh starts with an intent intent is the goal or what the nabh wants you to understand this uh, by implementing this particular chapter what you will achieve so this is to encourage healthcare professionals to identify and practice clinical practice guidelines so that is the first intent so clinic I'll, i'll talk in detail about what are clinical practice guidelines then you have to encourage patient safety as the overall principle for providing care to the patients it's just not about treating patients but you should treat them in a very safe manner and finally we in this chapter addresses as i said the specific services like icu transfusion er anesthesia og and pediatrics so let's get into the first uh, thing which is the um, care of patients is guided by accepted norms and practice so what do you mean by that so the first uh, objective element says that all treatment orders are signed and dated by the concerned doctor that easy you know um, easily said than done in our you know you can see in everyday practice the major nc happens because everyday entries are not signed and dated or the name of the doctor is not there 
But more important is the 1B, which show, says that the clinical practice guidelines are adopted to guide patient care wherever possible. So this is these two, we will uh, try to explain what, it, uh, what you, you have to do to implement in your hospital. Now, one of the things which you can start is to write the clinical practice guidelines along with your clinicians. For this, best is to take the top 10 or top 20 complaints to which your, you know, your, the, your hospital uh, patients are commonly coming to. So you list the common ailments and then develop clinical practice guidelines. And you also have to adopt clinical care pathways and follow it. And there may be some, as you keep adopting and implementing, there may be variations from what the guidelines actually say in actual practice. So it is a, a feedback you get from the users and then you have to change these clinical practice guidelines and clinical care pathways. I will talk in detail about you know, on these clinical practice guidelines and clinical care pathways in, in a bit, but this is the first thing you have to do for treating patients. The next the orientation of the doctors, one, the doctors should understand the need to sign, put the date and the name, and also the time of the entry. In short, it is known, you know, a lot of quality jargon will be, you know, thrown at you. SNDT is a jargon which says sign, name, date, and time. So this should be in every entry that the doctor makes in the case sheet, whether it is a progress notes or orders or a prescription or theta notes, whatever it is, the signature should be there, name, date, and time should be there. And the doctor should be oriented to fill the relevant details. And in-house residents are the best people. You know, you make them, you know, your friends and you tell them when the doctor comes on rounds, make sure that you get the signature of the consultant so that the consultant signature is on the case sheet. Now, this is the you know, um, the main difference between clinical practice guideline and clinical pathway. So let's talk about the clinical practice guideline, which is the you know, first step. So the clinical practice guideline is about particular disease. For example, it could be clinical practice guidelines for acute appendicitis or clinical practice guidelines for treating myocardial infarction or a stroke. Uh, these sort of you know, specific disease-based clinical practice guidelines. So they offer explicit recommendations and as I said, cover specific clinical circumstances. So usually they are governmental and non-governmental agencies and uh, the, it can be used by any institution. These are general guidelines which can be used you know, once it is developed and it is based on evidence, then it can be adopted and adapted to your particular uh, hospital. Both are important. You adopt the clinical practice guidelines, don't just copy and paste. You have to look at your local uh, needs and discuss with your doctors and adopt those clinical practice guidelines so that you will be in practice, it is possible to implement those. So there are no timelines provided in this and it does not trace the patient outcomes. It just, just says, has this guideline be followed? When you do an audit, all you, all you would see is whether the particular um, features of the clinical practice guidelines are being followed. And this, as I said, involves a particular clinical condition. Whereas clinical pathways are implemented you know, in uh, actual practice and it charts the care to be given for the entire clinical course. For example, we recently developed a clinical care pathway for patients coming with ectopic pregnancy to our emergency room. So here, when a patient comes with ectopic pregnancy, we first put the outcome. What is the outcome you want? We want an ecto patient with a you know, confirmed diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy to be in the operating theater within 30 to 45 minutes. That is the outcome. Now, to have this outcome, you have a lot of um, uh, departments involved. Of course, the emergency department, then the obstetrics department should be there. Radiology should be there because ultrasound is required. Labs is, you know, have to be involved because uh, you know, a HCG has to be measured. So you can see this is a multidisciplinary approach and it involves a group of local doctors and nurses. And it is purely in institution specific. If you take our clinical practice guidelines and try to implement in your hospital, it may not work because the way your emergency and your operating theater is uh, functioning may be totally different. So this is a multidisciplinary uh, pathway 
and usually it starts from the time the patient enters the hospital to the time the patient uh, they gets discharged. There is another clinical care pathway which our orthopedic surgeons have, which is known as the happy hip clinical pathway. So here, anybody with fracture neck of femur, it says, you know, how quickly the patient goes to theater, you know, how the physiotherapist should be uh, uh, rehabilitating the patient. And within a short time, the patient has to be discharged home and the home car uh, takes over after they go home. So all these are in the clinical care pathway. So I hope, you know, I made myself clear. Clinical practice guidelines are for a particular uh, diagnosis for like appendicitis or myocardial infarction, whereas clinical pathways are for a whole uh, journey of the patient for a particular condition in the hospital. And usually it involves multiple departments, whereas clinical practice guidelines involves either medical department or surgical department like that. And in clinical pathway, you can measure the outcomes, whereas in um, practice guidelines you just show, uh, uh, see whether the guideline has been followed or not. So this is very important and both of these have to be implemented. So for an entry level, you just take up five conditions and maybe one clinical pathway and try to implement it. So here's an example of, uh, this is a uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines of appendicitis. So it says what should be done at admission, what happens if it is a gangrenous appendicitis or if it's an abscess. So this is a typical, clinical practice guidelines. Whereas this one is a clinical care pathway. You have to start from the bottom. Okay, this is for the discharge pathway. So when a patient is ready for discharge, what do you do? No, you, it goes to the uh, billing office and then the local GP, and then it goes to the home care service. Then you talk to the relatives, that is number four is, you know, uh, uh, district nurse, uh, uh, that is the home care nurse talks within three days. And then it goes to five, the GP, then it is evaluation again by the district nurse and then the family is involved. So this is a clinical pathway which takes a long period of time and involves multiple stakeholders. Now, how do you implement COP1? One is check the patient medical records, whether your clinical practice guidelines are being followed, whether the doctor is uh, no, uh, putting the SNDT signature, name, date and time, and all these should be documented in the FX manual. Now, one of the things is, you know, when I started the journey in quality, when I sat in these sort of uh, things, so many guidelines and things are being thrown at us. Now, I want to go back and see where I can find these guidelines. So, at the end of each um, standard, I'll be giving you references. You just have to Google this. So, if you have to go to Clinical Establishment Act webpage, you will see clinical practice guidelines for almost all the common conditions. So, this is an example I've taken from the clinical establishment act as i said don't just copy and paste it use this as a reference guide talk with your doctors and develop clinical practice guidelines for your hospital now we're going to the second standard we are entering to the department-wise standards so first was the norm and here we start with the emergency department that is the most uh, entry level um, of patients who have who need urgent and immediate care so there are one two three four five objective elements so it, one is the documented procedures address the care of patients arriving in the emergency, including medical legal cases. 2B is all the staff should be well-versed in the meaning that they should be about life support. It could be basic life support, advanced life support, or pediatric life support. They should be well-versed. And admission to or discharge to um, or home or transfer is documented. Ambulance is properly equipped and it is manned by trained personnel. These are the five objective elements. So how do we implement it? When you take the emergency department, you should make sure that it is easily accessible at the hospital entrance. This should be the first entrance or easily accessible entrance. And the emergency should have adequate beds and it should be running 24 by seven. And the, it should be, you know, you should have a process to register the patient, provide first aid, be aware, that is all the staff should be aware what are the services available and should be able to manage all patients. You should have a list of medical legal cases and register the medical legal um, so formalities when these patients come and follow all the processes and procedures and the staff should be trained to provide CPR. So these are the functions of the emergency department the staff should be able to provide. So the ambulance should be marked in a demarketed ambulance parking area and it should be easily 
accessible and should be able to exit the you know, this area very quickly. It should be well equipped. Resuscitation equipment should be available in the ambulance and emergency medicines uh, must be made available. We will talk more in detail you know, about the emergency medicines. So one small point I wanted to make is when you're storing emergency medicines, do not store it within the ambulance. In India, the temperature outside goes to very high levels, even to 40. And keeping you know, life-saving emergency medicines in the ambulance, in the hot sun, we are not, we will not make them work. So usually, we keep them in a box ready for use. And whenever there is an ambulance pickup, we just carry the box to the ambulance and go. So that's a small tip for storing emergency medicines in the ambulance. So the ambulance staff should be have a licensed driver. There should be a trained medical staff, at least BLS trained, to be able to provide CPR. Now, in the ambulance, there are two uh, elements. One, it says the staff should be well-versed. So that means they should have basic life support. And either the doctor or the nurses should have the uh, advanced uh, life support as well. And uh, this is what is 2E. The ambulance is manned by trained personnel. And again, ambulance standards, no, you don't need to look anywhere. Uh, Indian government, the automotive industry standard has, uh, has a very detailed document, which is known as the automotive you know, industry standard for road ambulances. This is called the National Ambulance Code. So all the you know, various definitions, there are four types of ambulances it is defined. Type D is the advanced life support. Type C is the basic life support. Type B is, uh, is the transport vehicle, which is taken to uh, in um, diagnostic centers. And type A is this, the first, uh, that is just the basic uh, first aid responder. It just could be any vehicle. So these are the four types of vehicle. All this and many details, including you know, how the patient area should be designed, you know, what should be the um, you know, CC of the ambulance. Everything is there in this particular document. And whenever you know, all these, you know, it is said in quality, what is documented is not done. So whatever you uh, do in the emergency department should be documented. You should have a nominal register with the patient details. There should be an EPEX manual for the emergency department uh, policies. And there should also be case sheet and transfer forms and discharge notes, which should be available in the emergency. So whenever a patient is transferred, you should use the uh, transferred or sent home. You should use the appropriate form. Now, again, uh, the building of the emergency services uh, and the emergency department itself, you can find this is very useful. It is known as the Indian Health Facility Guidance. So this is mainly for government hospitals, but you know, I, if you go through the district hospital standards, so you can see here the, um, the standards for an emergency unit. It is very detailed and you'll, you'll find it very useful whether you are up to the uh, mark for your emergency department. So all these are available now freely and because of the net, it is very easy to access. So make sure you download these things and as a quality manager, you should be aware of this. And when uh, an assessor comes and asks, what is this you have done and what on what basis you have done this? You can just view this document and say, this is what we have based our uh, emergency department or whatever part of the hospital this is on. So nobody can ask you a question. Next, so we finished emergency department. So this is, as I said, we are going from emergency to you no know, other elective things. So the next emergency thing which will be required in the hospital is blood and blood products. So this is the COP3. So the COP3 says, uh, all about blood and blood products. So uh, that again, there are five objective elements. One is policies and procedures for rational use of blood and blood products, documented procedure for transfusion, and then all the laws and statutory things which govern the transfusion services in our, our country. How do we take informed consent for donation as well as transfusion? And finally, the procedure for documenting and reporting transfusion reactions. So this is all about blood transfusion. So if you have a blood bank, it should have the valid license. You should have an inventory and ordering schedules for the blood. And you should also arrange for safe transport of blood. If it is not available and if it is your storage facility, then you should have an MOU with the blood bank from which you are getting the blood. And the blood storage center also should be licensed and follow the National AIDS Control Organization, that is the NACO guidelines. So when you talk about informed consent for blood transfusion, 
every blood transfusion should have an informed consent separate consent okay but if there is multiple transfusion for example the dialysis or people with uh, uh, bleeding disorders they may have multiple transfusions it is you know in, 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 it is enough if we have a single consent and the patient counter signs every time they come for it uh, tra multiple transfusions and this one consent is valid for 6 months and whenever there is any change in the blood product or change in the way you are going to do a fresh consent to be taken and this consent form should be detailed and the patient and family should be informed about the risks benefits transfusion reaction and also there should be a section to educate them on blood donation because the most vulnerable uh, um, time for them to donate blood is when the near and dear are needing the blood so this is the management of blood transfusion reaction i'm not going to go too much into detail basically you stop the transfusion inform the doctor main thing from the quality point of view you have to write an incident report and report the transfusion reaction to the blood bank and when there are major reaction whatever blood which is remaining should be sent to the blood bank you should get a urine sample and send uh, again to the blood bank blood bank will perform a detailed root cause analysis and will present it in the next transfusion committee meeting so the um, transfusion committee vigilance is is a mandatory committee even for entry level hospitals and even for blood storage centers so three is implemented before transfusion during transfusion and after transfusion before transfusion you can give transfusion only based on a doctor's orders and getting the informed consent of the patient and then send the uh, request to the um, uh, blood bank and the blood bank does the cross matching and then sends the blood to the uh, ward after checking the vital parameters the tra transfusion is administered and there's monitored every half an hour for the first two hours and then uh, till the transfusion is done and then you uh, after transfusion also you have to monitor the patient closely for two hours and then all the empty blood bags cannot be discarded directly they have to be autoclaved in the lab uh, autoclave and then only disposed in the red plastic bins so for blood transfusion again document in the apex manual what are the indications for blood and blood competence in your hospital what are the policies for donation consents managing blood and blood competence storage transfusion reactions and discarding the blood bag so again as i said all the uh, details and you know, guidelines for storage transfusion are available in this document released by the naco very detailed and you, if you go through it you will find you know you can develop your own guidelines and develop your sops and put it in your apex manual so that is about blood transfusion so next we are going to intensive care unit and blood uh, high dependency unit so here there are only two objective elements so it is in consonance with the documented procedures and 4b is adequate staff and equipment available so let's you now quickly go through this and see what is in store so what do you mean by adequate staff so first of all they should be familiar with the admission and discharge criteria from the icu they should be well versed in the infection control practices they should be bls and acls trained so they should be able to provide both basic and advanced cpr be aware of the protocol for evacuating patients in the time of disasters or fire so because these patients could be ventilated they are on oxygen so there is a you know increased fire risk so they should be aware of all these things so mock drills should be performed frequently in the icu and htu they should have main, no, maintenance so the equipment should be done and uh, the downtime should be monitored and they should be able to also provide end of life care so an icu doctor or an icu nurse or technician have got special skills and you should make sure that you um, recruit the staff with these skills and also do frequent appraisals so the equip equipment for the icu should be adequate and well calibrated the biomedical department of all the equipment uh, should be monitored by the biomedical department there should be ups ups backup because uh you cannot have you know uh, ventilators and uh, power breakdown crash cart should be well equipped all the gas lines should have alarms and there should be an operational checklist for all the equipment and uh, uh, the oxygen and finally fire detection and fighting equipment should be available and you know, very close by so that we can use it so the uh, when you get into the uh, nabh assessment 
and the assessors will come to check all this. They will check each and every one of these things. Though there are only two objective elements in the ICU, there's a lot of things to implement in the ICU. So as I said, the staff should be 24 by seven and the admitting consultant, you know, they should be available during the day and night they can be available on call. If for ventilated patients, the nursing ratio is one is to one and for non-ventilated patient, it is one is to three. So the, the, because of short staff, staff, you know, uh, uh, staff shortage, you cannot just recruit nurses from other areas and post in the ICU. Only trained ICU nurses can be posted in the ICU. And uh, the number of doctors should be um, according to the size and complexity of the ICU. Now, again, in the APEX manual, you should have the policies, admission and discharge criteria, how counseling was given to the patient relatives. Many of the ICUs are excellent in giving counseling to the patients, but unfortunately, it is not documented. So as you know, I said, in quality, what is documented is taken as not done. So make sure your intensivist maintains a notebook and enters the details. No, they don't need to enter the details, but at least the date and time uh, the uh, fa family of the particular patient was counseled. And uh, there should also be a standard operating procedure for non-availability of beds. If at all the ICU is full, what is your arrangement? Are you going to you know, have open another ward in your hospital? Or do you have an arrangement with another hospital where you're going to transfer the intensive care patients? So all this should be documented. And uh, the procedures of management of the patient should be as per evidence-based and national international guidelines. Again, you don't need to go far. The Indian Society of Critical Care Medicines has provided detailed guidelines for you know, the ICU planning and designing, as well as guidelines for each and every area of the ICU functioning. So it's a very valuable document and you know you have to make sure that these guidelines are being followed for your uh, ICU. So from the ICU, um, we go into the obstetrics department. So there are three objective elements in the obstetric department. The organization defines the scope of obstetric services and the scope meaning, are you, you know, just a basic obstetric service? Do you also manage high-risk pregnancies? So this is you know, what has to be decided by the organization and it should be um, in the scope. So the obstetric care starts from antenatal check, maternal nutrition and postnatal care. And also the organization should have a nursery facility to take care of the new needs. So once you have a labor ward, it should have a nursery facility. Now, how do you implement COP5? So all the antenatal uh, mothers should be registered. Again, this is a statutory requirement. So this, you know, this you know, state or the uh, uh, will, you know, every state has got its own uh, um, method of registering antenatal mothers. So that should be done. Regular antenatal checkups should be done. Immunization should be given. You have to check the vital parameters, monitor the mother and fetus by frequent ultrasound, administer the medication, and uh, preparing the mother in both in terms of education and emotionally, obtaining consent for the mode of delivery, whether it's going to be normal labor or cesarean, and provide nutritional education. So all this should be included in antenatal care. The postnatal care should include uh, providing all the newborns with an ID, because one of the you know, very fatal mistakes is mixing up of babies. So as soon as the baby is born, they're all provided with an ID band and they should initiate the breastfeeding within one hour of delivery, immunization and providing family planning advice and encouraging kangaroo mother care. That is putting the baby on the mother as soon as the baby is born. It's supposed to increase the bonding of the baby and the mother. So that is something which the uh, government encourages us to do. So, there should be a bilingual display of obstetric services at prominent locations. So what is the scope of services you do? Do you take high-risk pregnancies? And you should specify what services are available around the clock and what services are available at a specific time. What are the name and qualifications of doctors available? You should have a prominent display saying that sex determination is not done. And you know, wherever there is no ultrasound is being done. And uh, display, you know, as I said, whether you're managing high-risk pregnancies, and you should have the facility. If you're doing MTP, you should display the MTP license and maintain strict records of the MT according to the MTP Act. So MTP Act again gives very detailed guidelines, including the forms. And you should use only these forms 
for whenever you know, your MTP procedure is being done in your hospital. So uh, obstetrics involves a lot of other things like immunization services, uh, sick uh, newborn care unit, the management of low birth weight babies, and uh, you should have the MOU with higher referrals uh, centers. And also very important to have CCT facilities in the entry and exit to prevent child abduction and the child abduction prevention measures should all be in place. So this is like, you know, um, entry of each, uh, all the um, newborn unit should be guarded uh, either through a you know, um, card system or a number system so that, you know, anybody uh, cannot walk through, only authorized persons are able to get in and get out. So that's um, the obstetrics. Then coming to the newborn care corner, uh, there should be an equipment for placing newborn, that is you know, at the time of delivery. Suction device and oxygen should be available. Warm towels, uh, a clock, calibrated phototherapy units and weighing scale, and equipment for resuscitation of asphyxiated newborn. So you, whether you in the labor ward or in the theater, if you are doing um, cesareans, you should have a corner in the theater or in the labor ward where you have the newborn care corner. And as soon as the baby is born, the baby is taken to this corner and uh, you know, they are, uh, resuscitated or even you no know, cared for in the first few minutes in this corner only. So this should be available. Again, all the uh, guidelines for antenatal care and skilled you know, uh, and are available by the Ministry of Health, where very detailed guidelines are available there. Now from um, obstetrics, you naturally move to pediatrics. So that is COP6. So COP6 is the documented procedures guide B care of pediatric patients. So what are these? There are again five uh, uh, um, objective elements. One is the scope. Second is the uh, competency of the staff, what is known as age specific competency. We'll talk about this later. And the patient assessment includes detailed nutritional growth and immunization assessment. And also identification and security prevention uh, to prevent child abduction, also child abuse. Also, the family members are educated by nutrition, immunization, safe parenting, and also about child abduction. So these are the five objective elements. So let's look at them in detail. So the staff should have adequate age-specific competency. What do you mean by age-specific competency? The nursing skills which are required for a neonate is different from that required from a um, toddler. And that is different from a uh, school going kid. And that is different from a teenage uh, child. So these are different stages of a pediatric population. And when you uh, have pediatric uh, services and pediatric nursing or um, um, doctors, you should make sure there is a mix of age specific competency which is available. So that if uh, in an inpatient, for example, you may have a 17 year old admitted, and also a new and admitted. The same nurse, you know, we may not have the competency to take care of both uh, ends of the age group. So it is better to have a specific competency. And that is, it's not a, a mandatory requirement. This is what is advised. So they should also have uh, been trained to handle pediatric emergencies. There should be adequate nurse patient ratio. Again, it depends on whether it is a ordinary ward, whether it is an NICU or that is you know, neonatal ICU or a pediatric ICU you have to have the nurse patient ratio. Con patient assessment again is totally different uh, from the adult. So there should be separate initial assessment form for pediatrics. Identify code pink and act accordingly. Again, I'll talk in detail about code pink in another slide. And all the staff should undergo uh, frequent training to prevent child abduction and abuse because in your hospital, just one incident of child abuse is enough to finish that hospital. So you should always be you know, very vigilant and careful that this does not occur in the whole history of any hospital. And security personnel also should be trained and should be available 24 by seven. And as I said before, the CCTV TV should be directing the um, entry and exit. So this you know, CCTV sometimes has other uh, uh, vicarious benefits. You know, in one uh, very funny incident, uh, one of our senior uh, obstetricians went to uh, for labor and then came out and saw that her expensive uh, chapels, which she bought you know, from one of the very famous uh, footwear center was missing. And then the security department quickly went through the CCTV and found out one of the patient attenders had actually taken it. They were able to trace it and they uh, slip her back. 
So that's not one of the side effect of you know having the CCTV. Um, just you know uh, mentioning that to, so that you know, if you are uh, falling asleep to wake you up a bit. So the uh, child facility, I mean, child friendly environment should be available. So when you're talking about facilities, it should be child friendly. What do you mean by child friendly? The floor should be, you know, um, uh, injury proof. They should have a soft flooring so that even if the child falls down, they don't get injured. And you should have uh, very colorful walls and uh, uh, dolls and all those things available. And uh, they may you can also devise a separate uh, play area for these children. There should be a separate breastfeeding room and play room. Uh, so safe storage of medicines and vaccines should be available and you should have growth charts and things like that. Um, weighing scales should be available. We also, we already talked about the CCTV and uh, limiting entry to these places. Again, bilingual display, bilingual meaning uh, the language which is you know, majority spoken should be there in addition to English, which is the link language in our country. So to specify whether the services again are available 24 by 7, all the doctor's name and qualification of the doctor should be available. So the ID band uh, no, of, with the mother's name and the UHID should be fixed to this. Which this is what I was talking about, the newborn's uh, wristband. So the newborn will not have a name. So you sh sh they should be affixed with the ID band with the mother's name and the mother's uh, hospital number. And also the baby's footprint should be taken and recorded so that in now, if there is a confusion, you can always uh, um, sort of clarify this. Safe parenting is again all about education, uh, talking about child abduction and never to leave the child unattended in the hospital, authorize only close family members to handle the baby and teach parents about age specific nutritional immunization requirements, following a very strict visitor policy to the you know, nursery and the pediatric area and asking all visitors to carry visitors pass. These are all very important to make sure mishaps do not happen within the hospital. Now, code pink is the code you dial whenever you think that there is a, a child abduction episode. So as a part of code pink, there are certain things which have to be in place. We have to install CCTV cameras and there should be a rapid response team which you now gets into action. So the, this process should be defined and you should have mock drills. So the code, code pink mock drill uh, should be done. And uh, you could either do a tabletop because with COVID, no, we are not able to actually do uh, full fledged drills. Tabletop exercise is just getting uh, the, the main people and in a, you know, in a conference table or something, just you know, defining the process and asking each person what they will do. So this itself is a good learning experience. So that drill should be done you know, as um, frequently as possible. Training is very, very important and the staff competency should be checked to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. This uh, staff not only the nursery and uh, labor room staff, but also the security personnel in the hospital should also know how to handle it. So as soon as the code blue is done, all the gates should be closed. The alarm should sound and so many such processes are there. So for all this, the written guidance should be written and uh, uh, it should be done under the uh, supervision of the organization. Now again, we have the Indian Association of Pediatrics recommendations and guidelines for anything you want about pediatrics. So it's a very, very, you know, this website is very uh, extensive and you can download whatever document you want to you know, have guidelines about pediatrics. Coming to COP7, this is the last but one. So there are again uh, five uh, objective elements. Of, first is about policy and procedure. So when you say policy and procedure, they should be documented. That's what we mean. So when an assessor comes, they will ask whether this is you know, documented and ask you to um, uh, see the document. Dr. Anjani, can you mute yourself? Anjani Agarwal, thank you. All patients with anesthesia, should have a pre-anesthesia assessment by qualified trained anesthetist. COP7B and 7D is always confused. So 7B says pre-anesthesia assessment by a qualified trained anesthetist. 7D says an immediate pre-operative evaluation is documented. Many of you know, the hospitals miss this. So I will explain you now what this is about you now when we talk about it. So 7C is anesthesia assessment will result in an anesthesia plan and that also should be documented. 
a separate anesthesia consent apart from the surgery consent should be taken that is 7e and it should be obtained by the anesthesiologist now during anesthesia there should be close monitoring minimum monitoring is heart rate cardiac rhythm respiratory rate blood pressure oxygen saturation and etco2 that is n tidal carbon dioxide which checks the airway security and patency and then after the uh, patient uh, uh, comes out of anesthesia in the recovery room the post anesthesia status is monitored and only after stable they should be uh, um, moved out of this how do we know they are stable there are defined criteria like aldehyde score and the padss score and any adverse anesthetic events are recorded monitored and this is discussed root cause analysis is done corrective and preventive action is taken so that is all no uh, the thing in the cop7 so how do you uh, implement this so the pre anesthetic assessment should be done at least a day prior it could be done even before so in our hospital the pre anesthetic assessment it could be done even a week or even a fortnight before so detailed history exam any expert opinion if required no medical opinion or other specialist opinion endocrinologist opinion is taken all investigations are done they you know review back with the anesthetist and all pre op and post op medications are discussed with the uh, surgeon fasting instructions are given and all this is documented in the pre anesthesia assessment form so this happens up to 24 hours before the surgery and based on this an anesthesia plan is uh, um, done by the anesthetist it will identify the asa grading they will identify the type of anesthesia whether it is a regional or general discuss the plan of the patient and get an informed consent so this happens you know and the, the usually the night before the surgery when if for an inpatient for an emergency the whole uh, process is compressed the pre anesthetic assessment anesthesia plan will all take place within hours time so what is immediate pre op evaluation that is the you know uh, key of this thing so this is done just before the patient and being administered anesthesia usually in the re receiving room so the vital parameters are checked fasting status is checked the iv line integrity is there no is also checked we will see if there is any new medications have been added by the uh, doctor or if there has been any change in the you know from because sometimes the pre op evaluation would have been done a week or uh, uh, for 15 days ago so after that has any change happened all these things should be assessed and you also assess the mouth opening so this is happening within minutes before the anesthesia is being given and this is a quick check to make sure you have not missed anything so that is the immediate pre op re evaluation this is usually documented as a part of the anesthesia monitoring chart a, you know, a small column is introduced before the induction of anesthesia and you document that the immediate pre op re evaluation is done this is apart from the regular anesthesia assessment so i already talked about uh, mon anesthesia monitoring what should be monitored the appropriate equipment should be available and uh, there should be a technician who is trained to, to check the integrity of the anesthesia machine circuit and post anesthesia care is monitored so pre anesthesia assessment who should do it a qualified anesthetist uh, it can be done by a surgeon or uh, uh, physician but it should be an um, anesthetist uh, it, they should be uh, you know um, sort of clarified with the trained anesthetist just you know uh, having a physician or surgeon doing the analysis is not enough they could do an assessment but then it should be um, cross checked by a trained anesthetist the immediate pre operative evaluation should be done by the anesthetist and team member in the operating theater and post operative monitoring should be done by the anesthetist or the intensivist so for all this you should develop uh, standard guidelines and it should be documented so the type of um, um, anesthesia for what procedure this will be determined by the type of surgery what is the duration comorbidity and risk and what should be mentioned in the chart the pre anesthesia medication induction maintenance and reversal medications used post anesthesia care and post op and uh, operative anesthesia you don't need to worry too much about this because the operating monitoring chart is not standardized it will include all these details now there is a thing called moderate sedation which is not there in the entry level but this is worth mentioning in moderate sedation is where you don't actually give them anesthesia but give them sedation it could be just for reduction of a you know um, a dislocated joint or for a small surgical procedure 
But if you are giving sedation and the patient is not fully awake, that is known as moderate sedation. Why is this important? Moderate sedation should be done with two people. One who's doing the procedure and one who's monitoring the patient. So whenever you say moderate sedation, you should have a person, dedicated person for monitoring the patient and dedicated person and a person apart from the person doing the procedure. You cannot say, I, you know, the sedation was given and done by the same doctor. That is not acceptable and it is not safe. The anesthesia concerned should be bilingual. It should include the type of anesthesia, name of the anesthetist, what are the risks, benefits and alternatives, and it should be taken by an anesthetist. If at all there is a high risk, a high risk consent should be obtained and it will, you know, um, any ASA grade greater than three will come under the high risk consent. And the consent form should be explained to the patient before obtaining the signature. So transferring, as I said, from the uh, recovery unit to the ward should be based on the transfer criteria. Uh, for a daycare, it is PAD assist monitoring. And for inpatient, it is known as modified aldehyde scoring. So your anesthetist will know about it. Go and ask him and they will you know, implement this. Document the transfer score before monitoring and uh, transferring the patient and inform the anesthetist. And uh, the anesthetist will monitor the care when the patient is ready, reevaluates and sends, sends the patient. So you'll usually have a recovery nurse who does this. And just before transfer, they'll check with the anesthetist and then send them to the ward or to home. So what should be uh, documented in the apex manual regarding anesthesia? What is the procedure for anesthesia? Consent, what monitoring you do? Um, and the level of conscious in the, for anesthetized patients, all these things, vital parameter, level of consciousness, post anesthesia care, any specific criteria like the alterate or pads, adverse anesthesia events, transfer criteria, and uh, root cause analysis and CAP, all this should be there. So again, the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists have detailed guidelines and you can download this and uh, discuss with your anesthetist. So this is the last one, running a little bit late. So let me quickly finish. As a surgeon, you know, um, I think uh, uh, it's very easy uh, and also very complex, both at the same time. So that it involves pre-operative assessment and a provisional diagnosis, 8A. 8B is informed consent. 8C is prevention of adverse events like wrong site, wrong patient, wrong surgery. You just need one of these events. Your, your surgeon's career is uh, gone and your hospital reputation is gone. So you have to be very careful about this. And qualified persons are permitted to perform the procedure. So proper credentialing and privileging should be done. Operative surgeon documents the operating notes. So the, it can be written by others, but the signature, the operating surgeon should read the um, notes and sign it himself. And the theater should be adequately equipped. Patients and personal material flow confirmed to the infection control practices. So informed consent again, now there is a separate um, talk on this. So basically you have to have the diagnosis, date, surgery details, get the patient's name, signature, uh, the next of kin signature. If there is a translator, signature of the translator and also signature of the witness. Mention any high risk if it is involved the surgery and also sign with the patient's name, date and time with the medical council registration number. The consent form should be bilingual and the language which was used to talk to the patient should be mentioned in the consent form. So the post-operative care, I'm not going to go again in details. The, it involves you know, medications, wound care, complications, fitness for charge, uh, discharge, and what are the implant details, uh, post-operative diagnosis. So for implants, the sticker should be in the uh, operating theater register, in the uh, patient's uh, um, notes and also in the medical records. So these are you know, important. Um, so the hospital should be well equipped to perform pre-op assessments. Trained and qualified doctors should assess elective emergencies, informed consent is taken. So whenever you are doing site and site marking, you, the, every patient should be identified with two identifiers. Usually it is name of the patient and the hospital ID number. If you want, you can also add the date of birth of the patient. So that's the three, but a minimum two. Then the side, site and organ marking should be done. So what is the difference between site and side? So for bilateral organs like lungs and uh, kidneys, the side can be there. Whereas for unilateral uh, or organs which have only one, like stomach or uh, the uterus, 
it is a site. So if you are doing a gastrectomy, you mark it at that site. No, so all patients should have marking. Yeah, you cannot say this is a, not a no a, um, bilateral organ, and therefore I'm not marking. If it is a, not a bilateral organ, then the site should be marked. Ideally, the site should be marked for even a uh, bilateral organ because the site should be visible to the surgeon after draping the patient. So even after draping the patient, the site mark should be available to remind the surgeon of this site and the site. Okay, so that's very important. So pre-op checklist, a transfer protocols for sign and stymo, that is the WHO surgical safety checklist should be there. And for any um, errors, CARPA should be done. So the operating surgeon should have a valid qualification and she should lead the surgical safety practices. That is very important. If I say do the surgical safety checklist, everybody in the, as a surgeon, I'm saying, everybody will follow. But if the surgeon, if I myself, I'm irritated about the surgical safety checklist and do it as a, a routine task, nobody will be interested. So the surgeon should take the interest and do it and also write the post-operative care. Infection control theta, you know about the unilateral flow, uh, no, keeping the contaminated and clean items separate, having washing facilities and designated areas for waste management, linen, laundry, etc. So again, I'm not going to go too detailed into this. You know, any OT guidelines uh, you, you, you can follow. And the point to remember is, you know, uh, every hospital should have a well-equipped OT provide diagnostic services and have a recall procedure in case of infection. Suppose there is an wound infection, your CSST should be able to track which load was used for that particular uh, patient. And that particular load could have been used for other patients also. So you should be able to track it. So that is what is mean recall procedure. And the OT staff should be trained and they should have adequate prophylaxis for hepatitis B and they should ensure sterile technique uh, dispose the linen and add to OT zoning guidelines. So all this should be documented in the Apex manual. The preoperative assessment, diagnosis, investigations, surgical safety checklist, preoperative care plan, adverse events, and other procedures of monitoring. In the CSST, as well as cleaning, the theater, uh, linen management, and the uh, ETO usage, everything should be uh, documented in the Apex manual. So again, there is a very good WHO document called the Safe Surgery Saves Lives, I think, uh, um, updated, uh, and you can look into it. The surgical safety checklist is also available. That can be adapted again to your hospital and used in the operating theater for um, sign out, time out, and sign in. So I completed uh, my presentation. Um, So the first question is from Dr. Rajesh Babu. Uh, for maintenance of counseling records in ICU, what is a must according to NABH? See, NABH, NABH doesn't uh, no, prescribe saying you have to do this. this. No, they, they only give you broad guidelines. So basically, you know, the time of counseling and whom you, uh, the, the relatives of which patient was counseled. And just a very brief summary of what the counseling was done. Either was it about treatment, was it about ventilation, and that has to be mentioned. And it is preferable to have the signature of the one of the family members and then countersign by the doctor. So there's one query from Pallavi Dongra. Is it mandatory to have immediate pre-op anesthesia check if the patient admitted on the same day of surgery? Has the PAC done prior to two hours only? Well, emergency, as I said, uh, no, it can be done, but uh, you know, if you are following the surgical safety checklist, the pre-op uh, thing will be done. You know, the sign-in is actually immediate pre-op assessment. So if you're going to practice surgical safety checklist, either if it's an emergency or elective, it does not matter. Before the patient is uh, goes under, you will do the check. So it is mandatory. Uh, the next question is from uh, Dr. Bernalisen. What is a pediatric age group? Mm -hmm. 18 years, less than 18 years. Yeah, okay. uh, legally. So, and, uh, yeah. Legally. But uh, clinically, it's the same. Your hospital can right? have their own policy. You know, it's up to your hospital. If you want okay. to keep it at 16, it's up to you. But you know, uh, if when it comes to a medical legal case and uh, a 17-year-old is not seen by a pediatrician, they, you will be in trouble. 
So that's the reason most hospitals keep it according to the law. Okay. And uh, a question from Shweta Sharma. How to categorize anesthesia events into major and minor category? Okay, that's arbitrary, isn't it? Uh, mm. You have to discuss with their anesthetist. I'm not you know, very well versed at that. So I'm afraid I won't be able to answer that question. But but whatever you decide, you will have to make sure you document the same. That's it. Yeah, I think best is, you know, I'm sure you know, anesthesia, anesthesia uh, society, they have come out with a lot of guidelines. So check that. But I, no, I'm not very sure about it. And uh, and there's one more again from Pallavi Dongre. Is it compulsory to mention about anesthesia and surgery process, etc.? All things in the Apex manual. Or can we keep it uh, all in chapter-wise policies? It's up to you. No, it, it need not be in uh, one uh, book. You know, uh, for uh, it depends on the size of your hospital. If it's a twenty-bedded hospital, it makes sense to just keep one book. No, don't duplicate the process. But anything beyond fifty-bedded, it's better to go by uh, you know uh, the um, departments. That is easier to uh, maintain, and the departments will have ownership also. So, Shweta Sharma, I think uh, this also answers your question. Also, department specific standards required for NABH, entry level NABH. So, the NABH. So that is level, no, these are the standards which are required. No, uh, mm. You can divide them into uh, these are departments, isn't it? Each COP yeah. standard is department, emergency, and all those things. So, if you want to separate it, each standard into a departmental manual, that's up to you. You can do it. And another question uh, for neurosurgery, what is a must for site and site marking? Neurosurgery, again, uh, no, um, you, you, there are certain things like you, for ENT, and because you talked of neurosurgery, I'm talking, I also give that example. For ENT, especially if you're operating within the throat, obviously you can't mark. Dental, you can't mark. So it is putting in the wristband, in another wristband, not I'm not talking about the wristband you know, for the ID. You have to put another wristband where you write the name of the operation, the site of the uh, surgery and uh, sign it. So for neurosurgery, if it is feasible to mark, you can do it. But if you're operating in the brain and you don't want to mark it, add another uh, um, wristband and write the details. And when you are uh, inducing the patient, when, when the site and site is being checked in the timeout, that wristband should be used to check the site and site. And a follow-up question on that is, who is who's the primary, uh, who takes the primary responsibility to mark the surgical <coughs> site? Uh, so the next question is whether the implant sticker has to be stuck in the discharge summary also. Uh, yes, uh, it is a good practice to do that, but it all depends on how many stickers you have, right? At least in the normal register in the data, yeah. And in the patient's case sheet, if you have, you know, if it is in the discharge, uh, uh, because if the patient goes to some other hospital, it will be very helpful for the patient to have it in the discharge summary. And uh, with next, complications of the I'll, implant, that's what I'm saying. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Uh, last two questions. What is the difference between sign out, time out, and sign in? Ah, the surgical safety checklist has got three. Uh, portions. The sign-in, as I said, involves the anesthetist. It is led by the anesthetist and involves checking the anesthetic equipment, the vital parameters of the patient, uh, you know, all those things. So that is you know, uh, the checking of the anesthetic equipment, make sure all the anesthetic requirements are met. That is the sign-in. So that is done as soon as the patient is received into the hospital. The sign-out is done after the patient has been induced. Anesthesia has been induced. And before the surgeon puts the knife on the skin. So before you make that you know, uh, fatal error of operating on the wrong side or site, putting the knife on the patient, you do the sign out where you check the site, the side, the patient identity, whether antibiotics are given and all that. And that is led by the surgeon. So that is the time out. Whereas the sign out happens after the procedure is done and the patient is out of anesthesia, you look at specimens, you look at any you know, culture and sensitivity specimens to be sent or uh, pathology specimens, any equipment uh, problems it had that is documented. And finally, the you know, any anesthesia problems, all that is documented before the patient leaves the theater. So these are the three phases. It has been found if you implement this, 
the complications in the theta, that is the safety complications in theta, that is the wrong site, wrong patient and all those things come down, comes down by 60%. It's a very simple thing and you know, everyone should implement it. And the last question uh, from Uttam Mandal is, is it mandatory to calculate the nurse patient ratio separately for ventilation, non-ventilation patients? Well, if you have an ICU, you, know, uh, you, you will say one is to one. But if you have it, it's all you know, how you manage your staff. So it's not mandatory. In general, it is said ventilated patient one is to one, non-ventilated patient one is to three. You can say ICU is one is to one and IMCU is one is to three or one is to four. That's up to you. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Bari. We've been getting a lot of questions uh, and a lot of people have been asking for guidance. So I suppose uh, to the participants, if you want to get more uh, information from Dr. Pari and uh, guidance from him, you're free to be uh, part of the Kaho team, Kaho uh, universe, I would say, with a lot of superstars and uh, Dr. Pari is one of them. So thanks again, Dr. Pari, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. The best, you know, if and, you have not been exposed to this, best is to attend the CPQH course and they'll learn a lot. Yeah. True, true. So the today we are we are starting off with this NABH entry level NABH series. Now next we'll be moving on to the full NABH entry, uh, to the full NABH education series as well. So and then we'll they'll we'll slowly expose them to the CPQH also. So thank you again.